Hello and welcome to the first installment of Introduction to Operating Systems and Virtualization. My name is Scott Neal and for the next several weeks we will be introducing you to the fundamentals of virtualization. We're going to be looking at the three big contenders when it comes to virtualization in today's market. We'll be talking about VMware. In particular, we'll be looking at Workstation and Workstation Player. We'll also be looking at Oracle's answer to virtualization, which is, of course, VirtualBox. And we'll cap off the course by looking at Microsoft's virtualization utility, not only found in Server 2012 and 2016, but also in Windows 8 and Windows 10. And that would be, of course, Hyper-V. Uh, we're also going to be touching on various aspects of operating systems as part of this course. Uh, we hopefully will be able to, at the end of this course, be able to define some operating system fundamentals, uh, be able to discuss various types of operating systems, commonalities, differences. So we'll be examining different types of operating systems that you may see uh, during your if your support uh, environment, you may run into different types of operating systems, and we'll look at some of those. Uh, we'll look at Linux. We'll look at various types of Windows operating systems, and we may even touch on a, a couple other operating systems as a point of reference as well. So uh, for today's lecture, I really would like to give you an operating system primer. I'd like to give you a little bit of a history of how operating systems developed, uh, some of the basic concepts, how they work. Uh, I really would like to talk to you about different types of operating systems. So we'll be talking a little bit about single tasking versus multitasking and multi-user versus single user operating systems. We'll talk about threads and processes and we'll even discuss process algorithms that are used in today's operating systems for process scheduling. So let's go ahead and get started. As far as this course goes, we will define an operating system as the program which interfaces with computer hardware forming a layer of programming code on which most other functions of the computer are built. So really an operating system is a collection of software. It's going to be managing the computer hardware resources. It's going to provide all of the common services uh, for computer programs. It's going to provide the security for the system. But most importantly, it's going to allow the user to interface with the system. The user will be able to, to put in input and get meaningful output from the system. Um, the operating system for today's environments is a multifaceted system, uh, but the heart of the operating system, the core programming code associated with what makes an operating system what it is, is called the kernel. Uh, and so all of the other code besides the kernel including the libraries, utilities, and even applications, is going to be said to be in user space and not needed to share the hardware. Uh, oh, since we're touching on hardware, probably ought to define hardware as any of the physical devices, including the CPU, the circuit boards, keyboard, monitor, even the disk drives. When we talk about hardware, that's what we're talking about. Um, so a brief history of operating systems. You know, uh, we talk about what is a computer. Uh, in my on-campus classes, I always like to hold up an abacus and say, here's the very first computer. Uh, an abacus really is just a device, a uh, wooden device that was used uh, back in ancient times with little things you push back and forth. Um, yes, uh, I actually have used an abacus, I have to admit. Um, an abacus does not have an operating system. Uh, it's still defined as a computer. Um, and it's capable of doing mathematical computations. And initially computers were used basically as large automated calculators. They were designed to take the tedium away from doing long computations for mathematical and statistical problems. As far as operating systems go, we can really trace that back to legitimate use about 100 years or so, but really nothing practical until we hit about the late 50s. So in the 50s, 60s, and even into the 70s, we really see a significant evolution of operating systems. In the 50s and 60s, those operating systems were very rudimentary, not able to do much more than read input, uh, whether the input came from punch cards or tape, and then the system generated its output, and then the output had to be dumped somewhere, usually on something like a teletype, 
Um, so because uh, it, you know computer applications were going to evolve and become something more useful for broader audiences, operating systems had to follow along and evolve as well. Um, can a computer function without an operating system? Uh, besides the advocacy, the answer to that, of course, is yes, it can. Uh, this, for instance, is a 1950s computer utilized by the Lewis Flight Propulsion Laboratory. Uh, that's, by the way, now the John H. Glenn Research Center in Cleveland, Ohio. And it was used primarily for engineering computations. Uh, another example would be this Mark A um, uh, ship gunfire control system. Uh, and it was um, installed on a lot of post-World War II ships used for targeting uh, targets that were land-based or ocean-based targets, uh, surface targets really, uh, and it took input that whether that input was weather related like wind speed or the motion of the ship or the direction of the ship uh, and other various aspects and it was inputted into this device. This device uh, mechanically then generated uh, a range finder for you to point the guns and aim at and hit the target. Once again, no code was used really to as an operating system for this device. It was uh, generated through mechanical aspects. Um, so you can't have a computer without an operating system. Uh, but without an operating system, then your computer is really going to be limited in its functionality. So uh, operating systems uh, were destined to evolve. Uh, computers in the late 60s and early 70s, uh, even though they were quite crude when you look at today's systems or today's operating systems, they were still quite capable. They were responsible for space travel, uh, the uh, submarine basic uh, based ballistic missiles, and even the global financial community owes a lot to computers yeah, of the 60s and 70s. 60s and 70s also saw things like the beginning of the internet or ARPANET, uh, the creation of input and output devices other than a typewriter, things like display terminals, the ability to store data magnetically, uh, and therefore we could begin eliminating the things like punch cards. Um, and we also, because uh, we saw computers expanding their roles, operating systems began to expand their roles as well. So uh, we begin to see the development of operating systems that are have more functionality. Uh, those operating systems include OS 8 and Unix, for instance. Um, in the mid-1960s, probably the single most important milestone was the development of a simple programming language by Dartmouth College, and that was BASIC, uh, or Beginner's All-Purpose Symbolic Instruction Code. Uh, prior to BASIC, if you wanted to program a computer, you had to find some very boring guy in a white shirt and tie uh, whose sole function in life was to work with these things because programming computers was a very complicated process. Um, and therefore, uh, the realm of computers was really limited to a very small elite group of people. Uh, if you wanted time on the computer, you had to, you know, request this time. They had to assist you with getting the data into the system to generate your output and so on. So BASIC really allowed non-programmers to start exploring what could be done with computers. Probably one of the single biggest milestones when it comes to operating systems and what it meant. Um, I got you know, I cut my teeth on BASIC. Uh, the computer that we had in school, its operating system was BASIC. Uh, the TRS-80 Model 3 ran on BASIC. Um, so there's a lot of us out there that owe uh, that first spark of exploration when it comes to computers and what can be done with them to the, uh, the development of BASIC. Uh, with that said, BASIC was not the only important uh, operating system to evolve in the 1960s. Uh, and though we're not going to talk about uh, Unix uh, as part of today's lecture, we are going to have a lecture devoted to Unix later on, um, in, and Linux most importantly. 
uh, because Unix has the distinction of being the very first multi-user operating system. Unix was way ahead of its time, way ahead of its time. And if you look at operating systems today, you will see elements of Linux, or the offshoot of Unix, being um, integrated into all of these operating systems, including Windows. But we'll talk more about that later in a later week. Um, so if we move into the 1970s, we start looking at other milestones. We start thinking about people like Bill Gates. Um, Bill Gates uh, really got his start by writing a compiler, which is software that turns computer code uh, written by people into code that is understood by computers and for basic. So uh, he took that compiler and then he sold it to a company. That company was called the Micro Instrumentation Telemetry Systems, or MITS as most people know it. Uh, and they became the first company to, to actually produce a desktop computer. Here's the man himself, Bill Gates, in his younger years, um, and he's holding up some of his wares here. Uh, that computer on the back, I believe, is probably one of the very first IBM systems, uh, the IBM 8080 probably. So this picture is probably a little newer than 1975, but anyway, uh, we'll move forward. Uh, Bill Gates took the proceeds from that first sale and he started his own company, a little company called Microsoft. Uh, Microsoft uh, led to the development of the Microsoft Disk Operating System, also known as MS-DOS in 1980. Now there are other versions of DOS out there. We're going to be playing with something called Free DOS, but really all of these are incarnates of MS-DOS. Uh, MS-DOS became a runaway success. Uh, it was really the first operating system that was widely distributed for microcomputers and it did have to be loaded from a disk or tape. Uh, nevertheless, IBM adopted Microsoft for its PC. IBM really was responsible for getting PCs into the hands of millions of people. In 1984, uh, we go into the 1980s, we start seeing Apple Macintosh play a role. They're responsible for the very first graphical user interface. We also refer to that as a GUI. And they also were responsible for the very first mouse pointing device. And this allowed users to very simply interact with an operating system on a graphical screen. Uh, so Apple even though they have a very small percentage of the market today, really uh, did us a big favor because it was Apple that got Microsoft to think about creating something like Windows. So in 1985, Microsoft, their answer to their competitor Apple was to come out with Windows. Uh, Windows in that period of time, and even for several incarnations, was an operating system that sat on top of an operating system. Uh, you had to install MS-DOS and then you installed Windows as a component on top of it to provide the GUI interface. And it had basically many of the same functions as a Mac OS system. So. Brief history of an operating system, and uh, we'll talk a, a little bit more about operating system evolution later on. But uh, we do want to talk a little bit about what is an operating system, uh, and we will probably be best by discussing that from a perspective of functionality. So, what are the several levels of functionality of an operating system? Well. Operating systems are responsible for providing functionality for the computer for things like memory management or processor management. They are responsible for managing the devices. They are going to be responsible for the creation of and storing of files in a meaningful way so that they can be retrieved, uh, saved, retrieved, and modified. They are going to provide the security for the system and they're going to also be responsible for the maintenance of, controlling of, and monitoring of their own performance. They're going to also provide things like job accounting. They're going to look for and be able to detect errors and give us meaningful data back about what those errors mean and how to correct them. And they're also going to coordinate between other software and the users. So we're going to talk a little bit about each of those functionalities in some way today. Uh, the operating system 
uh, manages primary memory or main memory. Uh, main memory is really a large array of words or bytes and where each word or byte has its own address. Uh, so for a program to be executed, it's going to have to reside in main memory. Uh, the operating system is going to monitor the primary memory usage. Uh, in in multi-programming, the operating system will decide which process will get memory and it's going to also decide on how much memory and when it will need to add or subtract from that memory. The operating system is going to also allocate and deallocate that memory as the processes need change. Um, so as far as processor and file system management goes, a program uh, that is loaded into memory and executed is commonly going to be referred to as a process. The operating system will therefore be responsible for scheduling that process or deciding which process gets use of the processor and for how long uh, through the use of something called a traffic controller or a resource manager. So think of a resource manager as a admin assistant in an office and you want to talk to the boss. The boss is the CPU or processor and you have business to do with the boss you are a process um, so you're going to have to schedule time with the boss um, and the person who's going to be responsible for scheduling that time is the admin assistant now there are different ways that that admin assistant can schedule time with the boss for you and we'll talk a little bit about some of those different ways in a couple slides down. But really, in that particular analogy, you are the process, the boss is the CPU, and the admin assistant is the traffic controller or resource manager. Just remember that for now and you'll be fine. Um, different operating systems can support different types of file systems. We might want to think about that. And operating systems, uh, the OS is going to be responsible for managing all the aspects of the file system, whether it's resource allocation, um, uh, whether or not uh, uh, how the maintenance of the file system and the security of the file system as well. Uh, some other types of operating system functions. Security. Uh, so the operating system is going to be responsible for preventing unauthorized access to programs and data. Uh, never more important than it is in today's environments. Uh, the very first operating systems were insecure. Uh, Windows. Uh, Windows was uh, basically a very insecure operating system for many incarnations. It's They are more concerned about usability than security. Uh, we live in a different world now and operating systems today uh, require a significantly different approach on how security uh, we implement security in operating systems. We're going to touch a little bit on that uh, in later weeks. Um, they're going to also maintain some control over system performance. Uh, things like recording delays between a request for service and a response from the system. They're going to provide job accounting uh, or keeping track of time and resources that are going to be used by various jobs, various users. Um, they're going to be responsible for error detecting. Uh, that's going to be things like program dumps or process traces or error messages, debugging, error detecting aids. All of these things fall under the error detecting uh, functionality of an operating system. And they also provide coordination between other software and the users themselves. They do this through compilers or interpreters and assemblers uh, and other software that's going to have to be coordinated. Uh, through different users or even different computer systems. So how does uh, the operating system work? Uh, if we look at this, you see that the kernel represents a layer uh, that separates the hardware from the application layer. So the kernel's role really is to act as a liaison uh, between the hardware and the applications. Uh, we do this uh, a little differently than earlier operating systems. We'll talk about that later uh, when we talk about device managers. But uh, 
Um, kernel, the operating system originally for most operating systems was uh, all of the instructions, um, all of the device um, drivers for hardware was integrated into the kernel. And so anytime you had major changes to hardware, uh, marketed hardware, the kernel had to be rewritten. Uh, and um, that is a kind of a laborious uh, process. Then the operating system has to be updated. Um, so we have compartmentalized a lot of that functionality now. And that's why you see device drivers as a separate component as part of uh, so it's more um, component, uh, there are different components for the operating system that allow us to make those changes more readily. We'll talk about the advantages of that later on. Um, so today's high-end workstations uh, look very similar to low-end workstations. Um, hardware used to be a defining aspect when it came to the functionality of a computer. Um, not so much so today. Uh, I can run a server uh, operating system on my desktop. I may not run optimally, but it will run. It will function as a server. Uh, likewise, if I wanted to, I can put workstation operating system on a very large server and it will be one very nice workstation. Uh, it may not use the hardware at the optimal level, but the uh, hardware no longer drives the functionality of the system. The functionality today is really defined by the operating system. So uh, today's high-end workstations look very similar to low-end workstations. So the application software used is usually that differentiating factor. Uh, so there are some other factors to consider. Speed of the disk control, size, speed of the hard drive, memory. All of these are important factors in how that operating system is optimized. Uh, but really the, optim the operating system today really drives the functionality of the device. Uh, computers and operating systems can be looked at in terms of one or more following characteristics. Uh, time sharing or real time, single user versus multi user, or single tasking versus multitasking. So, I'd like to talk a little bit about some of those differentiations. Um, batch systems were probably the very first operating system uh, def by definition. Um, so, a batch system really has no direct uh, OS interaction by the user. Uh, jobs in a batch system are going to be prepared offline. They are submitted with other similar jobs for processing by the operator and they generally are characterized by a high CPU idle time with a very limited method of prioritization. Um, if you remember the days of checks or when you go to the bank or you go to um, the grocery store 20 years ago when you wrote a check, uh, unlike today where the money comes out instantly out of your account, you had to wait until that check cleared the bank. And that check was uh, cleared through a batch process. All the checks were put together. They were um, um, put together so they could be processed at the same time. And then all the checks for the day were run at the end of the night through a mainframe system for that bank. And then your account was reflected reflected the actual balance at that point. Um, so that's an example of how batching works, um, where we take all those, in, all those components, we prepare them, and then we submit them to the CPU for processing. Uh, another way of defining an operating system is through time sharing. So a time sharing system is going to use a share processor time um, so I be able, as a user, I get a, a slice of processor time um, by using various terminals uh, which are connected through some sort of central infrastructure, um, which represents the CPU. Uh, multiple jobs, uh, which we refer to as multiple uh, multitasking, is going to be accomplished by allocating each processing request a sliver of time. 
and quickly switch between one user's job request. So in a time sharing system, uh, I will sit at a terminal. I have certain input that I've given to the system, but I may be one of 10 users. So I would get 10% of that CPU's processing time. That's oversimplified, of course, because we also have to think about the maintenance of the OS and the system also eats up some CPU usage but it gets the point across. So you get a sliver of that time um, in the processor to have your request processed and then your output generated for you. So we refer to this as time sharing. Uh, so mainframes are a prime example of a time sharing system. Uh, a distributed system can be characterized as multiple processors that can process simultaneous real-time requests from multiple users. Um, and uh, one of the elements in a distributed system that's very important are buses. Uh, buses are connected circuit pathways, uh, which allow processors to communicate with each other to reduce the load and increase system reliability. All computers have different types of buses. Um, we are going to be looking at buses in more detail later on. Um, a network operating system is really a server-based operating system whose primary function is to allow shared file and printer access among multiple computers in a network. Um, they are going to be, in general, a very stable system. They're easily upgradable and can be maintained and usually can be managed from or from a uh, centrally managed and security is managed centrally in a network operating system. Uh, examples of network operating systems would include Windows Server 2003 and above, Unix, Linux, Mac, uh, Novell Netware, BSD, these are all uh, categorized as network operating systems. Uh, Real-time systems uh, can be generally characterized as user requests that are processed nearly instantaneously. So uh, the the time it takes from the input uh, to processing that time is negligible. So there are different types of real-time systems. Hard real-time systems will guarantee critical task completion while a soft real-time system are, is going to have some flexibility in how it prioritizes jobs. So with a hard real-time system, uh, you really think about weapon systems as a hard real-time system. Um, they're going to, they have, a, you know, these, they have certain critical functions that need to get done regardless. And so they are going to uh, have the priority of the CPU all the time. A uh, soft real-time system will have flexibility and that prioritization is going to change somewhat based upon the primary function of that system at that given time. Um, they do have some uh, other things to think about. Uh, Real-time systems generally can also be characterized by limited data storage and memory function. Uh, because of the nature of how they work, uh, the memory function, uh, they're going to require uh, a, a very fixed time constraint to operate, so they have to have uh, very limited data storage and memory function. Uh, so, like I said before, weapon systems, medical imaging systems, air traffic control systems, these are often uh, developed as real-time systems based on their criticality. Alright, so talk about uh, types of operating systems in more detail, uh, we can also look at how the user interacts with the system. So single user systems, uh, a single user, single application system will deal with one person at a time. It will run uh, one user application at a time and we think about things like early mobile phones, microwaves, these are single user, single application systems. If we start thinking about single-user multitasking systems, then we're looking at operating systems that will be designed with a single user in mind, but it will be able to deal with several different applications that are going to run at the same time. Uh, multi-user systems, on the other hand, 
supports multiple users that are going to have the ability to access the computer concurrently and the operating systems hardware and software facilities concurrently. So uh, multi-user systems will be both time sharing and real-time sy systems can both be categorized as multi-user systems. Uh, an example would be client-server systems where a small part of the work is done on a central computer or server while most of the work is going to be performed on a computer at the user's desk. We refer to that as a client. Uh, client-server architecture is a predominant architecture in today's computing environments. When you think about things like how the internet works, uh, you have a web browser that interacts with a server that has data on it. That data is sent to your web browser and then compiled in a meaningful way. That is an example of a client-server architecture. Uh, online gaming is certainly a client-server architecture. If I look at uh, my gaming server and I look at um, the actual game that's running on my computer, I will get two totally different screens, right? The, the gaming server is going to be generating data and I can look at that data and if I know what I'm looking at, I will be able to make certain determinations from that data like how many characters are currently playing and the status of the system and things of that nature. And that the data from that server is being sent to the client or in this case many users clients that are playing together uh, in a multi-user system uh, and that data is then being parsed by the client or an application on the client that turns that data into something from a graphical perspective that means something to you so you know when you go on the gaming server the the gaming server is not showing me anything in 3d nor do I care uh, you, on the other hand, have all of the graphics and all the icons on your desktop that allow you uh, to see and run that game in 3D. So that's an, a good example of a client-server architecture. Lots and lots of client-server architectures out there. Medical record systems, um, just about uh, uh, email systems, all of these things really are client-server architecture based. Um, we really didn't have the ability to do client-server computing until we had a PC invented. So when the PC was introduced, that gave us the ability to develop client-server architecture. Um, cloud computing is another type of operating system. It provides a scalable web-based applications and services over the internet, uh, which are then used by clients through web browsers. And uh, Microsoft will describe three types of cloud models. The private cloud, which allows computing resources to be kept uh, tightly held by an organization and used exclusively by them. Hosted private cloud is when we allow resources to be made available through a third-party outsourcer, but are still only accessible to users within a specific organization. And then the public cloud, which is where we have a variety of resources that are available to any organization through a third party. And each organization is going to subscribe only to specific resources, which may be shared by other organizations. Uh, so you think about things like Amazon Web Services, that may be an example of a public cloud, or even a hosted private cloud, because there are some of those resources only outsourced to certain uh, organizations. Um, you may think about uh, Dropbox, uh, you may think about Google Docs, um, Google Web Services. These are all examples of cloud computing resources. Um, so back to batch processing. We talked about batching uh, earlier in this lecture, we talked about batch systems. Um, but I did want to talk a little bit about how batch processing works. And this is kind of important because we still use batch processing today. As administrators, uh, there are times when we want to use a batch process. We even can create something called a batch file, which will allow us to generate a series of sequential steps that can be run simply by running a file, uh, which we refer to as a batch file or batching something. So uh, what is batch processing? It is a technique in which uh, operating systems can collect the programs and data together 
and in a batch as we referred to it before the actual processing starts. And then the OS is going to define a job which has predefined sequence of commands, programs, and data and is going to categorize it as a single unit. The jobs are processes or sequentially, so each of each of those jobs are going to be processed sequentially. And uh, because of the nature of how it's processed, it's going to be difficult to debug. So uh, something to think about. Uh, single tasking versus multitasking. So uh, we define operating systems. And one of the things we will talk about is single tasking versus multitasking. Our earlier versions of operating systems did allow for single tasking programs to directly access the hardware and that allowed a single task to use the processor exclusively until that process has fully completed. Now there are some problems with these earlier versions of operating systems that allow single tasking. Um, and for instance, they were more prone uh, to hangups. Uh, they were uh, typically tended to be more in, unstable uh, and they frequently would crash. Um, so today's operating systems manage access to the hardware. That goes back to having that resource manager there uh, and having that, ma that resource manager, that admin assistant that we talked about earlier today is more sophisticated than the admin assistant of yesterday. So um, today's, uh, today's operating systems uh, are more stable uh, and that is because of something called preemptive multitasking, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so the resource manager now has more uh, capability to uh, more control over how processes run in the CPU. Um, so one of the reasons why we did this was, of course, to facilitate the ability to multitask or run two or more programs at the same time. Um, I will say that true multitasking cannot be accomplished unless you have a multi-core or multi-processor system. Um, I was uh, listening to NPR um, a while back and they had done a study uh, which showed that people do not really multitask. Um, the human brain really switches from one task to another very quickly, giving you the illusion of multitasking. Uh, so when someone tells you they multitask very well, you can just laugh at them uh, under your breath and say, no, you don't. Um, you may be very good at switching tasks very quickly, but that's one reason why things like texting and driving is bad for you. Uh, it's because when you're texting, you're not really driving. Your brain is preoccupied with the texting piece of it. So. Uh, multitasking on a system, a computer system, works the same way. If you had two brains in your head, two processors, you could truly multitask. Um, so a computer that has two CPUs is truly multitasking. A computer with multi-core environments today is truly multitasking. Uh, but we really can look at multitasking from one of two different ways. One is cooperative multitasking and the other is preemptive multitasking. So uh, just to recap, when we talk about multitasking, it is the method of allowing multiple processes to share system resources. Time sharing uh, is, for instance, a method of multitasking, not true multitasking in the sense because we're sharing slivers of time, um, but true multitasking really requires the ability to process independently at the same time. Cooperative or non-preemptive multitasking is an early version of multitasking. The operating system will hand control over to a program for a duration of time. It's going to wait for that program to hand control back to the operating system. This is the way early multitasking operating systems worked. Uh, there are some caveats to cooperative multitasking. For instance, if the program does not give control back to the operating system, it's going to hog that CPU until it's finished. And sometimes it may never finish. So no other program can run until the control is given back to the operating system. So if we go back to our analogy with the admin assistant, the boss, the CPU, and you, the process, 
This would be the equivalent of the admin assistant saying, you can go see the boss now. Um, and then she's not going to, or he's not going to interrupt the boss and I's discussion until I leave. Um, that would be an example of cooperative or preemptive or non-preemptive multitasking. So I could spend all day with a boss. We could be in the office smoking cigars and drinking scotch whiskey and hanging out, laughing, having a good old time. And meanwhile, there are people lining up waiting to see the boss in the waiting room. But none of them can come in. That she's or he's not going to interrupt us until we're done with our meeting. So that creates problems. Uh, cooperative multitasking, we see this in early versions of Windows 3, uh, X, 3, 1. Uh, uh, early Mac systems were cooperative multitasking. Um, so uh, if you print a word processing file in this environment and then try to play solitaire, the card's not going to flip until the print job is finished. So obviously, that creates problems. So it didn't take long before they decided we need to do something about this. Maybe we need to give the admin assistant some new instructions. So we came out with preemptive multitasking. This allows the operating system to main control, control, control of the computer at all times. So uh, that allows us to uh, give a little bit of code at a time and then we're going to let the CPU work with that for a little bit and then we're going to turn that over to someone else. So if a program executes for a certain time, uh, certain time sequence, then the admin assistant, if I go in to see the boss and I start smoking my cigar and I'm not finished my cigar yet but someone else is scheduled to come in at you know, 910, I've been there from 9 to 910, that admin assistant is going to tell the boss, I have to leave, someone is waiting, and I have to leave. I can come back later and finish smoking my cigar with the boss, but until that other process is completed and other processes that have lined up are completed, I will not get another turn to the CPU. Unless, of course, I've been prioritized. It goes back to those other things we talked about earlier. Um, so, operating systems and main control uh, keep control over how much of the computer's resources are allocated to each program. Things like Windows 95, XP, Vista, and on up. Uh, all of these are, are going to be um, uh, preemptive multitasking systems. Mac OS X, Unix, Linux, and so forth. Uh, so, nice thing about that is I can play solitaire while printing a word processing file. Uh, it should work just fine. Um, like I said before, it's not truly multitasking in the sense that I am processing two things at the same time. We really are getting time slices on a single uh, processor environment, but it gives you the illusion and allows these systems to run concurrently. Uh, uh, allows these uh, applications to run concurrently. Computers must use more of its CPU and memory to support the operating system, but the behavior for the computers can be much more predictable and much more productive. <coughs> so, let's talk about, uh, talk about program execution. Um, when we talk about executing a program, we're completing processes which includes the code to execute, all the data to manipulate, CPU register management, and all those OS resources that are in use, and ultimately by loading the program into memory and executing it. So uh, the operating system is going to also provide for process communication and synchronization, and it's going to provide some sort of a mechanism for handling deadlock. Uh, deadlock is really a situation in which programs are going to be competing for the same resource and they're going to cease to function. Something has happened, they've tried to jump into the same memory address or something. Something's got to be the, you know, the, uh, the referee there to determine which one of those is going to have priority. So that's how it will handle deadlock. 
Um, file system management, we talked, we said that OSs are responsible for file system management, and they do so by providing an appropriate interface, uh, proper permissions, the ability to read from, write to, and administer the files and directories within the file system. Uh, we'll talk about file systems in more detail later on in the course. Uh, they also handle communication. So the operating system is going to have to route and synchronize all the data between the processes, whether they reside on the same system or are connected via a network. They're going to have to provide protection uh, or security. Uh, one of the ways that they may do that is through the file system management, but there are other ways that they can do that as well. So they're going to be responsible for making sure that these ultimately that the system is properly secured, that IO devices are not improperly accessed, and that the users are going to have proper levels of authentication to the system and its resources. And errors. Errors are going to be often generated by the CPU and the input-output devices or even in memory and the operating system is going to be responsible for monitoring errors, taking the proper actions, and ensuring reliable functionality. So being able to monitor and use input-output uh, devices is an important function of the operating system. So some important input-output tasks that are associated with the operating system would include handling input from the keyboard or other input devices. Uh, it's going to also have to handle all the output, whether that output is to the monitor, the printer, and other peripheral devices. It's going to also have to handle all the remote communications outputs. It's going to have to manage all the communications, where that communication is through the local network or the internet. And, and it's going to look at, uh, when it does that, it's going to have to be able to manage that input or output through specific devices, whether it's a network interface core card or some other device um, and it's going to have to uh, be able to store uh, data and retrieve data using different types of devices including disk drives or other types of storage mediums and last but not least it's going to have to be able to enable multimedia use uh, voice video like what I'm doing right now, recording this video for reproduction, um, whether I'm doing it from a camera or playing music, etc. So, one of the ways <clears throat> that we describe input output devices uh, is whether or not they are a block device or a character device. Um, Block devices, in a block device, the device's driver will communicate to the operating system and it's going to send entire blocks of data. Uh, hard drives, flash drives, data devices are prime examples of block devices. Um, and the blocks of data can vary uh, depending on the type of device and the use of that device. There are also other devices out there that do not uh, take data and slice it into chunks. Instead, they are going to send and receive data by single characters or bytes. So an example of a character device would be serial ports, parallel ports, sound cards. All of these are character devices. Um, there's always going to be a device controller and a device driver for each device to communicate with the operating system. And the whole premise of a device driver is that it will interpret data between each device's firmware and the operating system. So think of the device driver as a liaison or an interpreter. Uh, I always like to use the UN in, uh, analogy in class. I will say if you are in the UN and you're from you, you know, Yugoslavia, uh, how do you understand when the ambassador of the United States uh, start speaking. Well, there's some guy in a room somewhere, you got headphones over your ears, and that person's sole job is to interpret uh, English into whatever we speak in Yugoslavia. I don't know what that is. Um, and, uh, and back again, if I choose to speak or say something on behalf of Yugoslavia. Uh, that is essentially the way a device driver works. It, uh, data from the device itself is in its own language. 
and uh, the operating system is used to speaking in another language. So the device driver's job is to interpret back and forth. Um, this is amazingly a lot um, a lot better model than the earlier models. So it used to be that every device had to be uh, designed specifically for the operating system for which it worked. And that created, that's a very expensive proposition for a vendor. When you're having to create, you know, five or six different sound cards that do the same thing, but you need one for Unix and one for, um, you know, Windows and one for OS 8 and so on and so forth, um, that's very expensive. Writing code uh, generally is cheaper than building hardware. So it didn't take long before vendors said instead of us writing the code or every time we have to do something different with the code you have to incorporate that into your operating system and then re-release the operating system. Wouldn't it be better if we created some sort of special code uh, that was compartmentalized that we could just add it onto or tack it onto um, the operating system uh, as needed and update just that code. Uh, and that's what a device driver is. So examples of hardware that will require device drivers, whether it's hard drives, whether they're fixed internal or external hard drives, mice, trackball devices, yes, they do use device drivers, even though most of those device drivers are standardized today. Printers and scanners are notorious for customized device drivers, uh, but things like tape drives, flash drives, removable media, digital cameras, even video hardware all have device drivers. If it's a piece of hardware, it's got some sort of device driver that's responsible for communications to that device. So if I look at the device driver's role in the operating system, you will see that the drivers actually provide a sub-layer, so to speak, between the firmware and the hardware of the device. So hardware is the physical hardware of the card. That card has its own firmware that is written onto, onto the chip of the card and then that firmware is able to talk to the device driver. It is the driver that's customizable, that's rewritable, and can be updated easier than the firmware. We can upgrade firmware today, by the way. Um, and uh, drivers, operating system programs, we really think about this as being the software or the code that we have the ability to manipulate. The hardware and the firmware usually comes from the manufacturer, hard-coded, ready to go. All right, so some more terminology, spooling. Uh, spooling, when you hear people talk about spooling, it stands for Simultaneous Peripheral Operations Online, if you ever wondered what that was. Um, device op input output data and various input output jobs are stored in a buffer. Okay? And that buffer is a special area of memory. Uh, or it can be stored on a hard disk, uh, which is accessible to input output devices. And then the operating system is responsible for managing the spooling process since devices communicate um, and process data at different speeds. So the whole point of a spooler is to act as a buffer. Um, it is possible for the operating system to have the computer read data from a tape, write the data to disk, and then write out to a tape printer while it's doing its computing task. It's going to overlap the input output operation from one job with processor applications from another job. So spooling allows for this capability. It also allows us to you to take slower components and faster components and be able to buffer that data and then use the data in a meaningful way. Um, another component of the operating system that we will be talking about off and on, uh, not only in this course but in other courses, is the BIOS. If you've never worked with the BIOS, it stands for Basic Input and Output System. Um, it is really the low-level program code that comes with every computer. You can kind of think of it as the, I hate to use the word, the firmware of the system because it's, it's not really firmware for a particular piece of hardware. It's really the management utility that allows all the hardware to be seen. Um, 
<coughs> it initiates and enables communications with all the hardware devices on a physical computer. It's going to perform some standardized testing uh, at the startup, and we call that standardized testing the post-test uh, power on self-test. Uh, it will also conduct some basic hardware and software communication tests inside the computer other than the post test. But m after it does all that, its primary function in life is to find an operating system. So it's going to locate and initialize the operating system on the computer. There are some things that we need to think about when it comes to BIOS, particularly when we talk about virtualization. So uh, in order to run virtualization applications on your computer you're going to have to have a computer whose BIOS supports virtualization and if you go into the BIOS you'll find some sort of a virtualization utility and if that utility is turned off then your VMware player or workstation or virtual box they're not going to run at all probably um, until you activate or turn on that virtualization uh, in the BIOS Every PC is going to have a BIOS. Uh, it's going to be stored in something that we used to call it ROM or um, read-only memory. Uh, read-only memory is uh, just a memory uh, today. It has been replaced with non-volatile random access memory or NVRAM. The difference between ROM and NVRAM is that ROM was totally uh, firmware based. You could not rewrite it. It was built into the system. NVRAM uh, is a memory chip. Uh, it will not lose its contents like ROM when the computer is turned off. However, it is uh, it can be rewritten. So um, I have the ability to, if the BIOS is up, uh, has an upgrade that comes out, I can, through a standardized process, write that BIOS to the NVRAM chip, and that chip will then have the upgraded version of the BIOS. With that said, uh, we didn't have to worry about things like uh, BIOS viruses back when we had ROM. NVRAM opens up that little possibility that we could, you know, find some malware in the NVRAM chip if we're not careful. So, just another avenue which can be exploited uh, that we didn't have to worry about 20 years ago. All right. So we've talked a little bit about processes, and we've talked about you know uh, processes, uh, multi-user systems uh, handling processes one way versus single-user systems handling processes another way. But what is a process? A process is defined as an entity which represents the basic unit of work to be implemented in the system and capable of being executed once it's loaded into memory. Uh, processes are divided into four sections: the stack, the heap text and data. We'll talk a little bit about each of those. So the stack holds the temporary data associated with the process including the local variables, the function parameters, and everything else. So memory here is dumped when the function exists. Each subroutine is going to have its own stack. The heap is going to represent a free floating region of memory typically slower than stack memory. And unlike the stack, the data is going to have to be allocated and deallocated to and from the heap. So, um, whereas the stack uh, is going to be dumped when the function exits, the heap, if I've got data in heap memory, it will stay there until something comes along and says delete it out. So, if it's not properly purged, then the program will have something known as a memory leak. We will talk about memory leaks uh, perhaps a little later in, when we talk about performance. We'll look at performance. Uh, we do have some other courses when we talk about uh, support. Uh, support. If you're on the support track, um, you'll talk about memory leaks as uh, something to investigate when looking at poor system performance. All right, so how do processes work? Continue text. The text is going to include the current activity associated with the process, and it's going to be represented by some sort of value in the program counter and the data residing in the program's uh, processes registers. The data is going to contain all the global and static variables associated with the process. So 
processes are going to exist in one of five states at any given time. The initial state when I first create a process will be referred to as start mode. When the process is waiting to be assigned to a processor, in other words, all the data has been compiled and ready to go, and it needs to go through processing, it is now ready. And so it is in ready mode. Once I have assigned a processor to it, the, the admin assistant's found a processor and says, you may now uh, go see the boss, it's now running. Uh, if I have, um, uh, maybe the boss is on a phone call and trying to get some more information about what I need done, uh, I can be placed in a waiting room and that would be considered a wait state until all the resources are put together to complete the task. Once I've met with the boss, my process is complete, I will be exited or terminated. Hopefully not terminated in the sense of losing my job. But So, if we actually <clears throat> take that and graph it out, um, so uh, you'll see that it, once I create the process, I have uh, basically one of two choices. I can go into waiting mode. Okay, uh, once I am waiting uh, or swapped out in waiting, um, I can uh, go to the running mode. Uh, I can be blocked, uh, in which case I go back to waiting uh, and run again. Uh, eventually, the whole goal is to end up being terminated. So. If I am blocked, a blocked process is just waiting for some event to occur, uh, whether I need a resource available or something like that. <laughs> so uh, I create a process, I'm ready, uh, and um, when I am running, I can um, then be terminated once that process is completed. All right. So. If that's a process, what is a thread? A thread is an execution of the smallest sequence of programmed instructions that can be managed independently by a scheduler. So a process, however, is an instance of a computer program being executed. It can be made up of multiple threads of execution capable of running concurrently. So big difference, a thread is just the absolute smallest bit of code that can be managed by a scheduler. But I can have multiple threads that are combined to run concurrently that actually make up a process. Uh, so a process is going to have separate address spaces. A thread will share that same address space. Um, so that's another differentiation. <laughs> and in a single processor system, multi-threading is only accomplished by time slicing, where the CPU will switch between different software threads. All right. So, uh, so in that case, if we kind of know that a process is made up of multiple single threads, uh, which is really the smallest sentence that you can say to the computer, then what is a process control block? Well, it is a structure in the operating system that represents the process. Uh, it's going to include an ID. Okay, This process ID is going to be important. Uh, it is a unique number that's assigned to each running process. Uh, in addition to that, I will also be able to determine the process state what registers are allocated, as well as the memory information associated with that process, any open files associated with that process, and any kind of job accounting privileges and other communications info can also be uh, gathered from the uh, PCB. And if there are any other parent processes that were spawning this particular process I'm looking at, they will also be pointed to as well through the process control block. So the process control block, you know, if you go into task manager, um, things like process IDs are very important because they allow us to link processes to specific files, to um, what memory registers are currently being used. 
and that's very good for doing things like troubleshooting or looking for malware and things of that nature. So the component that catalogs all the PCBs for running all the processes is going to be referred to as a process table. So uh, when you go in the task manager, what it's really doing is just tapping the process table um, to generate a bunch of meaningful a meaningful list of what's currently running on the system, what processes are running, um, and then giving you meaningful information so that you can use that information to optimize or troubleshoot the system. All right. So process manager handles the removal of the running process from the CPU and the selection of another process on the basis of a particular strategy. So uh, we look into how that we create those strategies. There are several different strategies out there. Uh, the OS maintains all PCBs in the process scheduling queues. So what is a job queue? Um, a job queue is a queue that keeps all the processes in the system. Uh, the ready queue is a queue that keeps a set of all processes residing in main memory, ready and waiting to execute and a new process is always put into the ready queue. And then the device queues are really processes that are blocked due to some sort of unavailability, particularly to an input-output device uh, will constitute being put into the device queue. So uh, that's what uh, these, each of these queues mean when we look at uh, process scheduling. Uh, process queues are use different algorithms uh, to determine which process is going to be scheduled for when, and there are several different strategies associated with it. Uh, the first come, first serve strategy is a non-preemptive strategy. Uh, jobs are going to be executed on a first come, first serve basis, and so the job comes in, it's processed, and then it's first out. Non-preemptive means it's cooperative multitasking. So first come, first serve strategies really don't work well with today's operating systems. Shortest job next is another example of a non-preemptive strategy. The processor should know in advance how much time the process will take in order for the shortest job next to work. So it will look at a list of jobs along with an estimated completion time and it will simply choose the shortest job to do next. Um, then we move into uh, more complex scheduling strategies. Priority based multitasking, also non-preemptive where each process is going to be assigned a priority and then the process with the highest priority will be executed first. Uh, then we have the shortest remaining time uh, strategy. This is the first of the preemptive strategies uh, where the, it's kind of the same version of the shortest job next algorithm. So the job with the closest completion, uh, closest to completion will be allocated first. But if a newer ready job with a shorter time to completion comes available, it will be preempted. Another strategy, the round robin strategy, is also preemptive. This is where each process will be provided a fixed time to execute, and that particular time is called a quantum. Okay, so I think that's a good stopping point for basics of operating systems. So, what have we talked about? Well, an operating system really provides the foundation for which components are combined on the computer in order to interface with the user and execute oper applications. Um, the basic task of an operating system is going to be to enable the computer to perform input and output functions. Um, if you look at the history of operating systems, you're going to see a progression from physically huge operating uh, computers with no operating systems to large computers, to desk-sized computers with the operating system being the determinant as to its functionality. Um, device drivers are the uh, liaison between the uh, hardware and the operating system.
that allow me to extend the native function of an operating system to provide access and control over a wide variety of different types of block and character driven devices. And the BIOS resides on every computer system as a low level programming code that operates the computer hardware and then allows the operating system to initiate communication. It also performs various tests and does enable the startup of the operating system. Um, operating systems can be understood in terms of characteristics. We talked about time sharing versus real-time operation, multi-user versus single user. Uh, from the standpoint of the user, among the most significant advantages from the operating systems is the fact that we have refined the graphical user interface in Windows-based and Mac operating system systems. Um, early operating systems were single tasking. Uh, today's systems are preemptive multitasking scheduling algorithms. So uh, when we talk about single tasking, we're talking about cooperative multitasking, we're really talking about at least from a network operating system or operating systems that we'll be using uh, on our computers, these are waning or things of the past already. You see single tasking, cooperative systems on you know appliances and things of that nature today, but uh, our systems, our operating systems and our computers on our phones and so on have really begun to really predominantly be preemptive multitasking scheduling systems. Threads differ uh, from processes in that threads are going to be simply a subset of a process. They represent the smallest sequence of programmed instructions that can be managed independently by a scheduler. You don't need to know any more than that for this particular course anyway. A true multi-user system will of course have multiple users accessing and running a single application on a single computer at a single time on a multi-core system. All right, that's a, a good first lecture for the course. Um, next lecture, we're actually going to be talking about virtualization. And we are going to be uh, introducing some virtualization uh, concepts. And uh, I look forward to seeing you then. Thanks a lot.